before I introduce our, our speaker, I'd like to open up in a word of prayer. Um, Father God, thank you again, once again, for this night, and thank you for these men who uh, continue to come here, continue to show up. Thank you for the transparency that's in this room, God. We ask you um, to open the hearts of all of these men tonight, um, and we, we pray for Ken as he speaks, and we ask that the Holy Spirit uh, leads him in his words and gives him the right words to say to impact men in this room, and uh, just thank you so much for the opportunity for this, uh, we can just come here and fellowship together and, and with you. We pray in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. All right. We have an interesting testimony tonight um, of, a, of a man who has been coming here for quite a while. And he came up to me and he said, um, you know, I'd like to share my testimony. I've, I've spoke to him maybe about, I don't know, three or four months ago and he told me a story. Um, I won't really elaborate on it because I'll let him do it, but it's, um, it's, it's really powerful and I think you guys are going to enjoy it. Um, please give a huge round of applause for Ken Shear. fall over I know it <laughs> hi guys um, first of all Rick thank you for giving me this opportunity it means a lot to me um, what you just stated it was exactly what I wanted to do going into this I felt like if I can just impact at least one person make a difference in one person's life tonight that would be awesome and here's the thing oh, and here's the thing as he stated I'm going to tell my entire story from the start. I'm going to be real. I'm going to share it all. I've been through some good times and I've been through some really difficult times. And the most difficult time for me came last year in one of the most challenging times of my life where it just seemed like one thing compounded another and another. And we've probably all been there. But really what makes us who we are on a daily basis is how we overcome. So I have a question. I'm going to get you guys up to at least start. So how many of you guys, and if you have, I'm going to ask you to stand up. If you've been through an extremely difficult situation, maybe a situation that you would consider, I've been to hell. If that is you, I'd ask you to please stand up. It's pretty sweet. All right, so next question would be, if you, stay standing, if you're already standing, <laughs> if you tried handling that situation on your own, raise your hand. And finally, if you allowed Jesus Christ to help you through that situation, and it came out with a positive outcome, please sit down. Well, that's pretty awesome. I'm going to start out with one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I've had to deal with a lot of things and every day I say that verse. And I say that verse because it means everything to me. There are so many verses in the Bible that are so meaningful, but none more than that. And as I go through my testimony tonight, I hope that you understand that the reason why I started out with that verse is because I feel like we are tested every single day. And if we give our life up to him, the outcome is a heck of a lot better. So I'm going to start from the beginning. If you were on Facebook, you probably saw Rick's uh, conversation in regards to the way that I was brought up. And it wasn't really, I didn't accept Christ into my life until about four years ago. And um, I turned 40 next month. 
So I've lived my life mostly without the understanding of who Jesus Christ is. And the reason why is because I was born and raised in a Jewish family. My parents are the most amazing people in the world. And they are both my role models. And they mean everything to me. I have two older sisters and an older brother. My mom had two miscarriages, was told that she was not able to have children, so they adopted all my sisters and brother, and then bam, she got pregnant, and here I was. So I'm the youngest. I'm what they considered a miracle baby. And I truly believe, as I've gone through my life, that there was a reason why I was put on this earth. I grew up, as I stated, in a Jewish family with two loving parents. When I turned 13, I had a bar mitzvah, which in the Jewish religion, that is considered the time when you become a man. Around that same time, something very interesting in my family happened. My sister, who's 11 years older than me, who I never really had a relationship with because by the time I was old enough to know what was going on, she was already out of the house. She was baptized as a Christian. And it was the first time in my family I was kind of like, okay, what's this? What's going on here? But it came with a challenge. My entire family's from New York. My sister was living in New York at that time. And my parents, what I would consider quote unquote disowned her. It wasn't until I grew up a little bit more that I understand why, and that is that my sister joined a religious cult that hated Jews. So that didn't go over very well with my parents. And it was just a challenging time. So here I am in the Jewish faith becoming a man, so to speak, at 13 years old. My sister can't even be there because my parents have disowned her. And I didn't really know what was going on. So fast forward to the year 2006. At that time, I was 32 years old. I got involved with a business with a friend of mine. I'm an I have an entrepreneurial heart. I have an entre entrepreneurial spirit. My friend came up with a very unique concept for his business. And I got involved with his business and another one of my friends. So I had two business partners. And there's a key to remembering that. Because this is when my life started to really change. Business was great. My, my, uh, my good friend, he was my, one of my closest friends at the time, came up with a concept that would actually remove calcium from swimming pools. Now, some of you might be like, well, what is that all about, blah, 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 but you all know our water's very hard here. They recommend you drain your pool every two or three years, and he came up with a way to actually recycle swimming pool water, and I was like, well, this is really cool. I want to be involved in this, so I helped raise money. I went after friends and family and whatever else investors, and in 2006, on my own, I raised $750,000 to start this business. It was a very uh, scientific level business. The equipment was expensive. There was a lot of research and development. And I went after friends and family. They all believed in it. They all thought it was a great idea. Business was awesome. Life was great. Does anybody remember what happened in the year around 2008-2009? Rick, you'd probably remember in the real estate industry, right? Well, being in the swimming pool business, even though we had something revolutionary, we had a, we had a service that uh, people stopped using. People stopped spending money. Business tanked. And this is where my life pretty much changed. In 2010, 
we fell upon some very difficult financial times. My credit score was well over 800. I was never in de debt. But when we started this business, I co-signed on all the credit cards. I co-signed on the line of credit. And business wasn't so good. And the creditors started coming after me because we weren't able to pay back any of the loans. Now, for me, this was different because my cell phone was ringing 50 times a day. I had to keep hitting ignore from the 1-800 number. When are you gonna pay us back? When are you gonna do this? And I was confused. I've never been in a situation like this. I was raised in a family where you pay stuff on time. You don't pay, you don't buy anything that you can't really afford. Don't get yourself in debt. But unfortunately, because I co-signed on all this stuff, the creditors came after me first. So the year was 2010. And this is where my entire life changed. I was in Colorado on a family trip. We were in the Avon area, which I don't know if any of you know that. It's kind of near Aspen, which pretty much everybody knows. And I went on a walk. And I went up into the mountains. And Christ called me. I had a come to Jesus moment. I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't really know what it meant. I just knew that he was calling me. And I wanted to make some sort of change in my life. I remember the next day I got in my car. My family was all there. They were there for the week. I had to go back to work. It was a Monday. I drove all the way down the mountain. And it was one of the most amazing days ever. It was darker, cloudy, rainy, but it was in the springtime, so everything was green. And I called two people. And I said, I told them what I went through. I told them what I thought. And I said, I need to know more. I want to know what this is all about. They gave me two books to read. The Purpose Driven Life. I read that book and I was like, this is me. Like, everything I believe in, this is me. They gave me CDs about Christianity. I'm like, this is me. And then I called five friends and I said a month later where do I go to church I need to do something else I want to do more where do I go they all said Highlands so it was May of 2010 I walked into Highlands Church at 9 o'clock in the morning I had a couple friends that went with me I sat down and I'm like this is awesome <laughs> The worship was amazing. Everything they were talking about made sense. And I was like, I couldn't wait to come back. I was like, I have to wait till next Sunday? This is awesome. So, fast forward a few months. I went to church every Sunday. I read books. I met some amazing people, but there was another challenge in my life. The creditors were calling. I didn't know what to do. And for the first time in my life, I actually prayed for a purpose. And I said, God, give me a sign. I need something. I can't handle the calls. I don't know what to do. I feel so lost. Next day, I go to church. We were in Luke. 
And the theme of the, the sermon was about your faith is always tested when the challenges are tough. And I said, okay, I'm listening. This could be good. <laughs> We go through the sermon, and then, guys, something amazing happened. At the end of the sermon, the pastor said, I have a letter that I need to read to you from a current member of Highlands that went through some really challenging times, has overcome them, and I think it's very relevant to the sermon today. Okay. Pulls out a letter. Do you remember what I told you guys about the two business partners? The one thing that I didn't tell you was one of my business partners was unfaithful. He was an alcoholic. He lied to our customers, and it was a struggle for me every day to work with him. But I invest, I had all my friends and family invest their money into this. How am I supposed to just give up? What am I supposed to do? That's why I prayed and asked for a sign. Started reading the letter. Mentions this guy about 20 years ago was involved in a business with two business partners. One of the business partner was unfaithful. He was an alcoholic. Didn't take the business seriously. But this guy, just like me, had to take the brunt of the business. He later filed bankruptcy, moved on with his life, and is living a wonderful life. Okay, my tongue's, my mouth's on the ground. I'm like, I hear you. So the next day, I went into the office. I looked at my business partners and said, I'm out. I'm done. I mean, guys, you can't get a clearer sign than that, right? I mean, you pray about it. The next day, the story is exactly the same. It just happened 20 years ago. And I was okay with it. I walked in. I said, I'm out. Fast forward to March of 2011. One of the hardest days of my life. I had to walk into bankruptcy court. At that time, it wasn't just me. It was about 50,000 other people. <laughs> and I was in the waiting room with my bankruptcy attorney, and it was so many people. But I felt dirty. I felt like I gave up. I was a failure. But I also knew that I had God on my side, and it was going to be okay. So they put you in this room with five other people. Everybody got dismissed within two minutes. Like, it was literally, what's your story? Okay, you're good to go. My turn, to, I was the last person. I get to talk to the judge. I was there for 25 minutes. He reamed me from, head to, you had this business, you went through 800 some odd thousands of dollars. I, I don't think I could have felt any worse. Got dismissed. Trust me, guys, I'm still living the nightmare. Four years later, apply for an old Navy card, declined. Really? <laughs> But I got a Best Buy card, so it's all good, right? <laughs> so 2011 started out kind of challenging. Two months later, May of 2011, 14th, May 14th, 2011, the best day of my life. I gave my life up to Christ. I got baptized. I felt moved, 
by him. I knew that he called me the year before when I was in Colorado. And I also know that him putting me through that situation and guiding me and letting me know that it was all going to be okay, that it was the right thing to do. And boy, has it been a ride since then. I think about all the other speeches that have been up here. Everybody's been sued through so many things. We all have. Life is hard. But I figured and knew if I trusted in him, it was going to be okay. And I had no idea what to expect after that. The pastor that baptized me that day, I remember giving a speech. I was so weak in the knees. I literally like, I was like a board. He tried to get me to like loosen up so he can dunk me in the water and like, I don't know, like I was just having issues. I was so nervous. But after I was done, he said, you know what? I'm really jealous of this guy. And I was like, really? What for? He's like, because he has the best of both worlds. He's got the start and he's got the end. I was like, okay. Didn't really know quite fully what that meant at the time, but I do now. I truly believe that when I was called, he did it because he was going to save me from something big. 2014 was the hardest year of my life. Two years ago, my oldest sister, the one that's a baptized Christian, like I said, we never had a life together, really. We never had anything in common. She's 11 years older than me. We have something pretty amazing now. And unfortunately, it's not something I can share with the rest of my family. I remember when I made the conscious decision to become a baptized Christian, to have that conversation with my parents. Remember guys, this is, these are two people that I love, respect, and they're both my role models. They're the most supportive and amazing parents a son could ever ask for. They are amazing to all four of us, provide us with a food, all the things you could ever want. Two supportive parents that would do anything for us. And I remember when I told my parents what my decision was, I could see the hurt in their eyes. Now, I had to think, okay, 27 years ago when my sister was baptized, they disowned her. I was thinking, God, could this happen to me too? I mean, it's a legitimate worry. We never really talked about it. And for the first time in my life, I didn't talk to my parents for a month. It was quiet. One day they called me, asked me to come over, and we had a conversation. And I finally figured out why there was such a challenge with not only my decision, my sister's decision as well. My dad grew up in Brooklyn. I'm sorry, the Bronx. He told me that when he walked to school, he lived in a Jewish neighborhood, had to, what he said, primarily walk through a Christian neighborhood. And they used to call him a dirty Jew. They used to throw rocks at him. And I sat there and I was actually pained for this. Like, this hurt me too. I'm thinking, this happened so many years ago, but someone throwing stuff at my dad? But it made sense to me. These are 
emotional scars that it's hard to get rid of. They asked me a couple of questions which I answered, but in the end, they did say to me, we respect your decision, we don't 100% agree with it, but it's your life, we know that you've been through some challenges, and if this is going to help you, we understand. I then asked if they were going to come to the baptism, they said no, but... <laughs> So it's, it's, the dynamics are, are interesting. And when I was first invited to this group by David Noonan, I was always wondering, like, he kept saying, you got to come to this group. You got to meet this guy, Rick. You got to meet him. And I'm like, okay, why? Like, I don't, I never really knew. And then I came here one night. I think it was Donnie Ray's testimony. That was pretty powerful. And I was like thinking to myself, I'm like, God, I don't have anything that cool to share. <laughs> And the next day I met with Rick. And we had a great conversation. And if you don't mind me sharing, it's, there is a, a little bit of a bond here because his ex-wife is Jewish. And he's trying to get his kids to come to church. And his ex-wife won't let him. And for some reason, and I don't know what it is, and I'd really like to figure it out someday, I don't know what the stigma is. I don't get it. It makes no sense to me. Jesus was Jewish. The entire Old Testament is based on Judaism. I, I don't feel like we've swayed that far off the beaten path here. But it, it's there. It's real. So 2014 comes along with a bang. In February of 2014, my father was diagnosed with prostate cancer. I really didn't know how to handle it. I mean, you hear, oh, it's prostate cancer, it's the easiest one to cure, it's, you know, I don't care, it's cancer. Cancer's cancer. This is my dad. My dad's 78 years old at the time. He's got adult onset diabetes. He's on blood thinners. You know, I mean, he's active, but it's cancer. Prayed a lot. Struggled with it. It's my dad. Like, I mean, my biggest fear growing up is eventually my parents are going to be gone, and I'm like, I'm so close to them. I'm like, whoa, is this a possibility? Like, what's going on here? <clears throat> my dad later went through surgery. Um, he's fine now. Cancer's gone. I prayed for him a lot. We even talked about it. I said, Dad, I'm going to pray for you. He's like, I appreciate it. I'm like, ooh, that's a win. I'll take it. It's a win. <laughs> Around that same time, my cousin, who one of my cousins who I'm close to, who lives in New York, was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. They caught it late. It was in his lungs, it was in his brain, it was in his hips, it was in his shoulder. Okay. That was another hit. It's kind of tough to deal with too. Prayed. Challenging, hurt, got mad, got frustrated. And something was wrong with me. I felt confused. I felt lost. I felt depressed, I had anxiety, I couldn't sleep, didn't want to work.
and I just kept going through days after day and didn't really know what was wrong. I'd be driving in my car, I'd start crying. And this went on for over a month. And I cried every day. I was so depressed. And for those of you who know me, and if you don't know me, I'm probably one of the most positive, outgoing people there is. And I said, you know what? Like, I really didn't know how to deal with it. And when I say depressed, guys, I'm talking the lowest of the low. And I can tell you right now, and this is the part of being real. Guys, I wanted to kill myself. That's how low I was. And if it wasn't for my faith, I wouldn't be here talking to you right now. I decided it's been three years, maybe I should go to the doctor. My dad was just diagnosed with prostate cancer. Maybe there's something wrong, I don't know. But literally, guys, I would cry every day. I didn't want to get out of bed. Life sucked. Everything sucked. So I went to the doctor, explained all my symptoms. He said, well, let's, let's get you some blood tests and blah, blah, you know, they listen to my heart, you know, all this stuff. And I'm like, okay. He's like, let's go get some blood work. Got poked the first of what ended up being 50 times probably. And they called me a few days later and said, you've got excess calcium in your blood or excessively high calcium levels in your blood. I'm like, okay. And what do you do when you don't know something? You get on the internet and you're like, what's high calcium levels in blood? started reading and I was like oh, we might have an answer here the doctor said I want to do another blood test just to check it out see what's going on <clears throat> came back same high number everything I read my dad's a doctor too so I called him I'm like what's going on blah 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 it's all signs and symptoms point towards hyperparathyroidism. So everybody's familiar with your thyroid, which is right here. The parathyroid's directly behind it. Basically, it's part of your endocrine system and it messes with your head. I read all the signs and symptoms. Anxiety, feeling of low self-worth, uh, depression, thoughts of killing yourself, you name it, I had it. What does this mean? Next step, go get a scan. Scan came back and stated that I had a tumor on my parathyroid. It's like, okay, I guess I've decided to join this party with my father, but at least we knew something was going on. Some time went by, it was April or May at this point, still having all these symptoms because it just takes forever to go through this chain of doctors, insurance, getting poked and prodded numerous times, so on and so forth. They messed up the scan, the doctor said, I gotta get another scan, so I had to go in for another one, have an ultrasound, do all these things. And then I finally saw a surgeon and he said that you need to have surgery. It's minimally invasive surgery. We will put a hole here and here and a small one here. We'll remove the tumor 
and all your levels should go back to normal and you'll be probably feeling a lot better. Okay, cool. He prepped me for all this and then said, if there's a problem, you'll have to have more invasive surgery. It'll be a four inch scar. You'll have to stay in the hospital overnight just to make sure everything's okay and we'll go from there. So that was the night before surgery. This was back in June. Go the next day, get prepped for surgery, prayed a lot because I don't like being put under. And surgery was going to take at minimum 45 minutes if there's a problem, maximum two hours. I go in for surgery at eight. I wake up, it's 1.45 in the afternoon. And I was in pain. Delirious, but in pain too. We had a problem with your surgery. Of course you did, I don't do anything easy. <laughs> We found, they, they said that the tumor was on the left side, one. He cut, he couldn't find it. This is a guy that does two or three of these a day. I'm like, really? People are walking around with this, like, this crazy. So he kept cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting. They found two on the right side. And I had a really awesome six inch scar now, but you should see the other guy, <laughs> right? I spent two nights in the hospital and about a week later, I actually felt myself getting back to normal. About a week after, two weeks after surgery, pathology came back, both of them were benign, so that's good news. And I was like, okay, I'm feeling better, life is good, get back on track. And about a week after my surgery, I get a call from my mom who, <clears throat> about three years ago that my parents were traveling overseas and my mom developed this bacterial infection from the airplane, like the ride over to China or something. And it, it mimics TB, so they treat it like that, but it's not TB. Well, I guess some, she gets tested every year for this thing. They've had her on a variety of different drugs, antibiotics, which have destroyed her stomach. And my mom's now 77, and she's the most vibrant woman that I know. She is, goes to the gym every day, eats healthy, uh, just looks like she's 55 probably. And if she ever sees this, she'll probably wish I said younger than that, but it's a start, so. <clears throat> And a week after I was surgery, my mom called me and said, I have to have a biopsy. Okay. And it was an exploratory, so she actually was admitted in the hospital. They had to cut open her side to check everything out because some things looked abnormal. And a few days after that, my mom, who has never smoked, eats healthy, works out, full of life, was diagnosed with lung cancer. That hit me to the core. What's the treatment? Chemo. What's the effects going to be like? We'll have to wait and see. My sister two years ago, cancer. My dad, cancer. Somehow I got involved and then my mom decided to join this horrible party. 
And I thought watching my dad go through something was hard. Nothing compared to the way that I felt watching my mom go through this. Six rounds of chemo, one every three weeks. And I watched my mom's life slowly deteriorate. Because that's some nasty, nasty stuff. Was my faith tested? Yeah. Did I understand it? No. It's funny, I look back at this situation, and I'll talk about him in a second. I don't want to give him too much time, but I met David Noonan last March. And, like, I was always thinking, I wonder what this guy thinks of me. Like, I, I, I seem to attract all these horrible things, and, like, my life is in the dump, and... But he never gave up on me. And... He would call me pretty regularly, asking about my mom. I met him last March. We were talking about some difficulty times that we've been through, and he's like, I'm going to pray for you. And I don't know. It was tough. Guys, it was real tough. I was thinking, give your life up to Christ. Things are all going to be good. <laughs> but when they tell you that you put a bullseye on your back, I think that's a pretty fair assessment. Watching my mom go through this was rough. Couldn't get out of bed, had no energy, dark circles under her eyes. I mean, this is a vibrant woman who goes to the gym, goes, does everything. I would spend a lot of time with my dad because I want to make sure my dad, my mom is the one that kind of keeps him active, so I want to make sure that he's kept active. But watching my mom go through this, be in bed, be in pain, be miserable, be all this stuff. I don't know. It's tough. She went through six rounds of chemo. Usually she'd have a few days of good until she'd have to have more chemo, then it's plummet back down. But do you remember the Bible verse that I started out this conversation with? Proverbs 3, 5. I had to say it to myself every single day. Lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. Okay. Give it up to him. There's got to be a reason why all this is happening. In November of last year, I found out that a good friend of mine died in his apartment. 40 years old. I, I got down on my knees. It hurt me so bad. And I don't have this one memorized yet, so I have to read it. But this past Sunday at Impact Church, there was a verse that was read that kind of, for me, put it all together. I was like, okay. Isaiah 43, 2. When you go through deep waters and get, tr and get in great trouble, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. You know that phrase that I'm sure we all have heard numerous times that maybe you don't like hearing when you're going through it? God's not going to give you more than you can handle. Oh, yeah. One of my other favorite verses that I feel really describes life. And it was a verse that was 
mentioned to me once a long time ago. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Guys, we all have our own hell. We all go through difficult times. But I can tell you right now, the main reason why I am standing up here today is because I never lost my faith. And I truly believe that day on the mountain, God was preparing me for what I just went through. As I conclude my testimony, there are five people that I need to thank. Some of them are here, some of them are not. And they are in no particular order. I met David Noonan back in March of last year. Nobody has had as much of an impact on my life in a short amount of time than this man. I met him in a Bible study at Highlands. Kind of just started talking. He was going through some stuff. I was too. He looked at me, put his hand on my shoulder. He's like, I will pray for you, brother. And he's been there ever since. He also introduced me to this group, to Rick. And that one day in October, he kept pushing me to come. I never, like I said, understood why. But I think the night before, I got a Facebook message from Rick telling me with the information, the, ev the event to come. The next day in the morning, I get a text from David saying, here's the address, really think you should come tonight. And then within 10 minutes after that, Jeremy sends me another text saying, dude, you really got to come to this group. I'm like, okay, I'll come. And I'm glad I did. Because I truly believe, as men, there is a huge importance in surrounding yourself with other godly men. People that believe in not only you, but in Christ, and can keep you on the correct path that will be there for you when you're struggling, will pray for you even when you don't need it. This group has been instrumental to me. I drive here all excited. It's eight o'clock. I'm like, oh man, we gotta wait another week. But it's a great group. And I truly believe by the Spirit of God, this group will continue to grow. So thank you, David, for always being there for me. Thank you. I appreciate it more than you know. Appreciate you. My fiance. I swear this woman knows me better than I do. I've known her for three years. She's my best friend. She's my rock. She has always been there for me. She sees things in me that I don't see. She has made me a stronger person. She has made me believe in love. And it's interesting because in Psalm 37, 4, it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the pleasures of your heart. And he's done that for me with her. I love her with everything I've got. And I can't wait to spend the rest of my life with her. And there's no better gift than that. 
my parents. It's been interesting. About a week ago, I sat down with them. I wanted to let them know what I was doing here. Because I wanted my dad to come. We had a nice conversation. I shared with them that if it wasn't for my faith, if it wasn't for my friends, if it wasn't for these other people in my life, I wouldn't be here. They knew I had thoughts of killing myself. And for the first time, I decided to step up, have an open conversation with them, and tell them exactly what my faith, these guys have done for me. My dad looked at me and he said, God bless your friends. God bless this group and God bless your faith. I was like, wow, that's a pretty awesome step and I'll take it. Unfortunately, he didn't come, but that's okay because they told me that they love me, they respect me, they want me to be happy. And that's all I've ever wanted. Guys, if there's anything I can say or do at this point, I just wanted you to hear that it's been tough. I wanted to give up. I refuse to give up. I have made promises to myself to be the best man that I possibly can, to live a godly life, to pray every day, to now be 122 straight days reading the Bible because it's kept me honest, it's kept me real, and I truly believe that because of my faith, it's allowed me to be where I am now. It was tough. But I persevered, I overcame, and I wanna leave you with one last verse. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. God, is that the truth? Thanks, guys. I really appreciate you letting me speak tonight. It means a lot.